Hello and welcome to Unstress, I'm Dr Ron Early. Now, medicine's at its best when it names diseases and then can provide a pharmaceutical or a surgical intervention which solves the problem or, or actually, more often, the symptom the patient presents with. Uh, it's a model that doesn't lend itself to overcoming chronic health conditions because the causes, and for that matter the solutions, are often multifactorial. It's why I've found clinically over many years that using the five stressor model is a great framework for asking all the right questions and the five pillars of health and wellness a great framework for building or maintaining resilience. My guest today is Dr. Mark Donoghue, a general practitioner who has for the last 30 years been working with many patients who present with complex health problems. For example, chronic fatigue. It's such an interesting discussion of how medicine approaches complex health problems or diseases. And chronic fatigue is an excellent example of a condition that doesn't lend itself to some quick fixes. Apart from talking about chronic fatigue, we also go into how adults can pass toxicity onto their children. We also talk about the environmental impact on childhood behaviour and we also discuss the issue of vaccinations. Now, chronic fatigue is an excellent example of a complex condition where someone is suffering, but it's difficult to give an exact diagnosis. Now, for the sufferer and for their family and friends, it's a very frustrating issue. Now, it's a complicated disorder and symptoms may include fatigue, loss of memory or concentration, sore throat, enlarged lymph nodes, unexplained muscle or joint pain, headaches, unrefreshing sleep, a recurring theme in this podcast series, and extreme exhaustion lasting more than 24 hours after physical or mental exercise. Above all, chronic fatigue is characterised, not surprisingly, by extreme fatigue that can't be explained by any underlying medical condition. And often, tests frustratingly don't shed light on that condition. The fatigue may worsen with physical or mental activity, but interestingly, doesn't improve with rest. According to the world famous Mayo Clinic, and this is a quote, the cause of chronic fatigue syndrome is unknown, although there are many theories ranging from viral infections to psychological stress or trauma. And I love this part because it's a holistic view, which I actually agree with. The quote goes on, some experts believe chronic fatigue syndrome might be triggered by a combination of factors. Damn right. I could name five stresses that my regular listeners will be familiar with. Now, for new listeners, go back to episode one, the mission statement. Mark's practice focuses on these problems, even before we became aware of the potential for harm from environmental uh, stresses, a concept that even today some circles are not readily accepting. Mark and I discuss how we all have a physiological limit. Pull on that limit over enough time from multiple directions and things start to fall apart. In fact, we have a very interesting discussion about how medicine approaches healthcare in general. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Dr. Mark Donoghue. Welcome to the show, Mark. Pleasure to be here. Ron. Mark, you have been uh, practising for quite a few years now. Um, Don't push it. <laughs> Don't push it. <laughs> look, we both have. But let, let, look, to, enough to say there's been quite a few years and for most of that time you've been involved in chemical sensitivity. Um, tell us a bit about that. I got dragged into chemical sensitivity. It's not an area that you go to voluntarily. But people who I was seeing with chronic illnesses kept reporting this odd thing that fragrances, things that they'd used all their life, at the time that their health turned, they became sensitive to alcohol, they became sensitive to chemicals, fragrances, supermarkets they'd go into, couldn't go down the washing aisle. And at first it was just, oh, that's coincidental because I've just heard that from one or two or three other people. And then it became such a pattern that it was clear that something was going on. People don't lose alcohol tolerance voluntarily. They like their, their drinks. And so something was going on with each individual that their tolerance for the outside world was changing. It was possible that the outside world was changing as well. But as the chemicals just added and added and added, that I was back in the time where organochlorines were the pesticides being used. They were really long-lasting, powerful, immune-stimulating, oddly, but oncogenic. They would cause cancer given time. 
So I was picking on these chemicals because the pesticide exposure was a trigger. But then I found out solvent exposure was a trigger as well. People worked in service stations, got the same sensitivities, and their health declined in a way that wasn't fatal, but was really, really disabling. They got chronic fatigue in a way that was not just, I'm tired, but I can't get out of bed, I can't go to work, I can't do anything. And so I followed that through. We even built an environmental unit back in uh, 88, 89. I was going to get you to put a time frame on this because yeah. this is is going back quite a few it years is. and well before people, a lot of people are talking about it now. But, I know. But I know. <laughs> dare I say it, Mark, I you know. were a pioneer in this area because it's not something medical school covers. Yes. And on occasions I talk to those people and say, hey, we were there 30 years ago. Mm. And uh, the answer is, oh, really? I never picked mm, it up. Mm, mm. So uh, it was a discovery that the people who were talking to me in my practice, I spent a long time talking and I got a chance to hear what their origin stories were, how they got sick. There was always stress in it as well. Mm. So it was not one factor. It wasn't I got poisoned by chemicals. Those people either lived or they died. And there were people that I saw so poisoned that they died. But the others were a mild poisoning. The body did not adapt. And mm. from that time, the 20th century was not their friend. The places that they could go, the things they could do, they just couldn't do anymore. And we published this. We, we actually did some research with Uni of Newcastle. We published in the Medical Journal of Australia. And I remember the editorial being, well, that's fascinating research, but it can't be true because these chemicals only affect insects. And then the story later on, OK, now we've got rid of those chemicals because they were bad, but the new chemicals only affect plants. And so every time the story of poisons is the same, we introduce poisons, we don't expect problems. The sensitive canaries that I see are the ones that are hit, they get sick. And then we go 20 years later, oh, wow, who would have thought that? Thank God we've got new poisons that don't do it anymore. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you mentioned when you're sensitive to one thing, then you become sensitive to another thing and your whole adaptive capacity is reduced. I think that's true. I also think that there are canaries and there are politicians at the other end. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the politicians, you could hit them with a hammer and they poison themselves with alcohol and they go on and they're completely unaware of the world. And at the other end, people highly artistic, emotionally sensitive. The concept of sensitivities. My patients are very creative, thoughtful. They can one example, they visit a specialist, they tell the spe they can tell in one second that that specialist doesn't care. They're not interested. And so they pick up other humans. They're sensitive to a whole range of things. And when the poisons hit, they're the ones that are also sensitive to the poisons. Hmm. And so I've become used to that, that sensitivity is a double-edged sword. You may be creative and artistic. However, if you are in that hypersensitive world and the world is not your friend, you suffer the consequences. And people, I think are hibernating. I think what happens is the body says, this is no good, and it takes them down a notch, and the thyroid goes down, and the adrenals go down, and they go into a kind of hibernating state, and the body keeps the alert going. The radar is still out there saying, where are those chemicals? And they get an out-of-proportion response to those chemicals, and we call it chemical sensitivity. Mm. And that manifests itself in, you've mentioned a few things, but how would someone know or what should someone be thinking about? If you know, how, how would they know if they're chemically sensitive? They know it simply because they can't do the activities that they used to do. Half of them find it that when they go to Woolworths and they head down the washing aisle where all the mm. detergents are, there's fragrances down there. They find that they get headaches, that they are dizzy, unwell, disoriented, and they have to leave. And so that's a very typical story that people are just doing their daily activities, thinking something must have been spilled. And then more and more, they're aware that mum's perfume is setting me off. I can't go down. I can't have two drinks with my friends anymore. And so it is a kind of closing in effect of the world mm. that they're they are in fact still intact when doctors do blood tests. The blood tests look fine, but their world is constricting. They're able to have less and less and less stimulus to trigger that aggressive response. So my, my research, my work for 30 years now is in chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated how you get to a stage of persistent, stable ill health that it is almost impossible to pull a person out of. So as doctors, we're used to dramatic disease, give you antibiotics, bang, you're through that, doctor cures you and you go home. And that's how it works in hospitals. Mm. 
you come out to the community and a person comes in and says, I'm tired all the time and I get headaches with chemicals, you think, I can cure this. And as a youngster, I thought I could. As the years have gone by, I realise every individual story is a kind of puzzle to be unwrapped. And you, if you don't spend the time, you don't hear them tell you the answer. Well, that's just so interesting because I'm a mentor of mine many, many years ago, a woman who was a physician, 92 years old, once said to me, if you listen to your patients, they'll not only tell you what's wrong with them, but they'll often tell you how to fix it. But of course, you've got to know which questions to ask. And a lot of the medical practitioners are just not pursuing that line of environmental issues, are they? I, I think that we've become a profession that got defined by Medicare or Medibank when it originally started. And I know the dentist never went down that path and that may be one of the best decisions ever made. Mm. But if you have time pressure as a doctor, you don't do home visits, you don't listen, you're looking for getting that person out. The concept of the six-minute appointment being the optimal income for a doctor is true. And so if you're thinking of getting people out of your room, you're not listening to what they say. Taking what you said, every patient tells me how they're going to get better. The ones that are going to get better in the first couple of hours when they're talking, they make a little note of things that made a difference in a positive way. And they look to see if you're paying attention. So deep down in there, they know mm. an answer. For, they know where their answer is going to be. But if you're not looking, if you're writing scripts, you do not see that moment, that kind of point where they're saying, here's what's going to get me better. Can you help me along that way? Where the doctor's thinking, hmm, you've got symptoms that I've got a pill for. If you take this antidepressant, you won't be talking to me so long next time. Mm. And mm. so mm -hmm. that, that battle goes on of efficient medicine to cure disease in our disease models of pneumonia, of heart attacks and the like, works brilliantly. Mm. Bang, get in, do the job, use what you've learned at university to get the job done. It doesn't work when people present with complex illnesses. And I think that transition from the quick, efficient doctor to the listening patient doctor is something my medical profession is struggling with. We haven't figured a way to make an income from that. And so the doctors in integrative medicine the dentists that are making a move into holistic and integrative practices, you have to spend more time. You have to pay attention to the details that just get washed away in normal healthcare. Mm. Well, as a health practitioner, you actually need the mental and physical energy to engage with your you patients on that level. And I, I think that's a challenge too. I do. I do. And I, I agree with you that when things are simple, they're simple and you can do the scripts and you can get things out and it works. Medicine works that way. When things are complicated, the ability to say, I will engage with this, I will experience it, I'll feel what the person's feeling, is a whole new skill. Mm. And medicine regards the objective, statistical, scientific, double-blind trial as if it were a gospel of some type, that if you vary from that, you are an evil doctor. But the story of medicine at the general practitioner, at the face-to-face -face with the public, is the story of each person. And you cannot statistically normalise that. You have to say, my first guess is this. We'll do something. We do something that makes you worse. Okay, that's a lesson learned for you as an individual. So each person starts as their own baseline and we work through it. Mm. And I think that's really hard work when you just can't say the Bible says mm. X mm -hmm. and that is the given truth. Yeah. That's working through something where you've got to unlearn what we've learned at universities. Now, now you've been dealing with these chemical sensitivities for a long time. Uh, you know, you mentioned 1988. Oops, 30 years. Um, okay, I know, I know. I look, I'm Is just coming up. 30 years. I, I'm just coming up for my years. 40th year in practice, Mark. Uh -huh. So you're you're just, I'm just you're getting the hang of it. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, we. It's, how is this, how common? You mentioned chronic fatigue as well. How common is that problem? It's the commonest presentation to a medical practitioner. And so probably 40% of all consultations are about fatigue, feeling not right, nothing particularly wrong. So 40% come in, about 5% are solved by a medical approach. You're low in iron, you've got anemia, your thyroid is low on standard thyroid tests. So we've got about 40% presenting, 5% solved in the medical model, and the other 35%, which is about a third of the population presenting to doctors, of persistent fatigue of unknown origin. So it's incredibly uh, common, 
But the beauty is most people find their way out of it. The doctor may help, the doctor may you know, give them reassurance that there's no serious disease. One of the best things a doctor can do is make sure no cancer, no diabetes, no mm. stroke, no nothing. And that gives people the confidence to go and discover. The ones that are in the chronic fatigue syndrome category, the severe ones, I see are probably 2% of the population, 1 in 50, maybe as little as 1 in 30 now. There's a sense that there are more and the FDA in America is making a big move for authorising uh, substances to help with fatigue syndromes because they say it's rising at about 10% per year. Now, that's a big rise. It starts at a small base of 1%, but a 10% increase, 1.1%, 1.2%, 1.3%. It doesn't, doesn't take long before it adds up to millions of Americans and about 100,000 Australians. Mm. So it's not uncommon. It's incredibly disabling. Nearly everybody does no productive work. And so, of course, what happens today is everyone translates it to lack of productivity. That's the only hope that many of these people have for providing funding for research that will you know, uncover the details about what they can do. And what, I mean, you mentioned the, the standard iron tests and, and all the other blood tests that, that give you an immediate path forward. What are some of the other strategies that, the, the, uh, I mean, avoidance, I guess? Yeah, a good doctor should always do the obvious. And so we do have guidelines. So, and basically they say, make sure the thyroid's okay, make sure X, Y, Z. We go through that. When you find the person that doesn't have any of those wrong, you move to more subtle stuff. Maybe the genetics, maybe the methylation, maybe susceptibility to gluten. And so you look into the areas that are the less common things, but which are really critical per individual. And so that that is the step forward from, let's make sure you don't have a disease which medicine should treat, to let's understand the process by which your body's dumped you in here. And I think it's fascinating that the research is generally leading in one direction, that when they do the genomics and the proteomics and all of these omics, everybody's... Prote got a, I know yeah. genomics would be the genetic... Contribution. Uh, yeah, what, 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 the what, proteomics are the protein. Omics just means the area yeah, of its kind. Proteomics. Of its, so okay. there's the proteomics, the genomics, the immunomics, everything gets an omic at okay. the moment. Okay. But when they've looked at the broad spectrum... The things that researchers find is that people have a no disease state, but they have a pattern which is similar to hibernation in higher order animals and even worms. And so the shutting off of things appears to be voluntary by the body to preserve itself in the face of a stress or a stimulus that it cannot solve. Mm. And so the body sensibly backs off. We doctors often take, I can cure your thyroid, I'll push you back forward. And we get a person active again, but then they get sicker and sicker and the body backs it off again. And so I think we're in a new form of medicine. Disease is the failure of the body to handle what came before. And you go over the edge and doctors are there with drugs for disease and it works. If you go backwards, you can't apply those drugs. What you have to apply is some other strategy and understand why the body would back off. And if you just rampage in and say, I will push you back into function, something fails that's really significant. People get chest pain. They get uh, tumours starting to grow, things that they didn't even know they had. So I'm learning over my 35 years, five behind you, but <laughs> my 35 years is the wisdom of the body you've got to respect first. If yeah. you don't and you rampage over the top and you just say, I know how to cure you, which is often what people come in, I need to be cured of my fatigue. And to back off and say, let's understand it, seems, seems second rate somehow. But when people have got no sleep, their diet has failed up, they are putting up with stresses that they should not, they're trying to get back to work, going through all the stresses of NDIS and you know financials and everything. NDIS, the National, National Disability, Disability Insurance, Insurance Scheme. Yeah, wonderful. And I have dozens of patients for whom that is now their new stress. They get no support from the community unless they pass muster. What does NDIS say? You have to have a disease that a specialist will authorise before we are going to give you any money. Right. So people are clearly disabled. Everyone agrees they're disabled, but because they don't have a disease name, they fall out the edge. Mm -hmm. And so this concept of going back and saying, you know, I have, the, I have my line too, Gemini, genetics is a predisposition. It's not a death sentence. It's nothing like that. Everybody carries trapdoors of genes all the way through life. If you're lucky, you never yeah. tread on one of those trapdoors yeah. and nothing breaks. But nearly everybody finds a way of finding one of those. And when it goes, you drop down a level. 
then the environment, if it impinges on that and the environment is not right for you, go down another level. And so the microbiome is a responsive area here, from the mouth right through to the anus and probably all over the skin. There are factors at play that we doctors don't help when we say, I will help you with antibiotics. Mm. We now set a stage two years, three years, ten years in the future where that will come back to haunt us. Yeah. So I do, I do see this as the failing of a person who fails gradually. We all know how to handle a heart attack. We all know how to handle a tumour that's rapidly growing. What we don't know how to handle is when the body's stepping down step by step by mm-hmm. step, they enter a state which is dysfunctional and fatigued, but it's adapted. It's not going to let the person die, but it isn't going to let them live. There's the issue here of resilience too, isn't there? Sure because, is. um, And the other thing, as people search for their answer, their one answer from you, the doctor, mm. is this idea of cross-reactivity as well because – you know, people, I, I know that I've had patients who've gone off gluten and dairy and responded really, really well. And others who aren't well go off gluten and dairy and very little difference mm. until they explore the other things that they're cross reactive to, they may never have even considered. Yeah. So, this idea of cross reactivity is an important one, isn't it? It's, it is. I, I see that in a slightly different way. I, I worked with a naturopath many years ago. You may even have heard of him, William Bader. Oh, yes, so, of course. Yeah, Bill. We worked together, and he had this this visual imagery, which I loved, which is a boat with five anchors. You pull up an anchor, nothing happens. Do you toss it back before you pull up the next one? And so the idea of failed treatment came to me in my medical practice. I was doing things, people were getting better from chronic illnesses slowly. I rang Ian Brighthope, and he said, look, try intravenous vitamin C. And I had a couple of dozen patients. I started, and magic happened. These people got up thank you, doc, why didn't you think of that before? And so I thought, oh, it's just vitamin C, that's the cure. It was the cure when you'd done everything else, but it was not the cure when it was the first thing you did. I started to run a vitamin C practice and nothing happened because I didn't manage the allergies. They were still on their diet. They were still in their stressful job. What I mistook was the people had pulled up four of their anchors and they just waited for the fifth one to be raised. We all blamed the last thing that was done. Mm. And it was all the work before that had really unloaded those people and just all they needed was a push from the vitamin C. So I learned my lesson and I've taken that with me, that there are principles. It's not like if one drug doesn't work, move on to the next one. It's like if you have not paid attention to diet, if you have not paid attention to sleep, if you've not paid attention to susceptibilities, allergies, if you don't pay attention to them and you leave those dangling, the person doesn't get better. Hmm. And so trying to pick them out, it always seems like simple little things. I tend to love to use pathology or some measure to know when I've won a little battle. (laughs) Sometimes it's the lymphocytes, sometimes it's C-reactive protein, but you need these little things as doctors to give us confidence that we're doing the right thing. But the patient walks in and goes, no, that was a big thing. I went on stewed apple probiotics, a bit of um, saccharomyces. My gut's better. I'm feeling way, way better. Are you well? Well, still not well, but I'm halfway there. Hmm. And that kind of progress is not what we're used to in medicine. We think when we stumble on the right answer, the antidepressant, you will not be depressed when I pick the right one. Hmm. The doctor may not see that five years on, that antidepressant is the thing that the person is desperate to come off because it has just ruined the quality of life. But it worked brilliantly as an initial symptomatic cure. And that my problem with my own profession is... You mistake the power of the drug to do a short-term thing for something that's worth doing in the long term without going the extra distance of why. Hmm. We never ask why. We right. just keep on saying what. what, what I, another thing that occurred to me as you were speaking there uh, was also this confusion with the term allergy and sensitivity. I mean, there are hmm. different types of allergic responses and we kind of have this kind of, oh, if it's not itching, if I haven't got a hives, if I'm not running nose, I'm not allergic, I'm not sensitive. But there are other kinds of sensitivities. Half of all the people that just listen to you are scratching at this <laughs> moment. I just did as you said it. And so, yes, you're right. The term allergy is owned by the medical profession. This is something that patients and the world don't understand. Nosology is the naming of diseases. Doctors own it. When they say you are not allergic and you say, but every time I eat a carrot, my face swells, I feel terrible, I get constipated and I have to go to bed, that's not allergy because allergy is a type 1 histamine-releasing mast cell 
IgE-mediated sensitivity reaction. It's called a type 1 sensitivity. We've got four different types of those types of reactions. But when people say allergy, they mean, I have a terrible reaction to something. Yeah. And so you get this mismatch of the person eats gluten, feels terrible, bloats, gets pain, may get diarrhea or constipation, say I'm allergic to gluten. Doctor does a very specific test, goes, no, you're not allergic to gluten. They're both right in their own terminology. It's just that the crossover of that terminology is not right. Medicine's at its best when it's naming diseases. Did you have a heart attack? The T wave inversion will tell me, yes, you did have a heart attack. The person says, I've got chest pain. They're not interested actually in what is going on there. They want to make sure it's not a heart attack. But that chest pain that comes back with exercise, that's the thing that they're trying to get better. So doctors are technically right because they define what's right and what's wrong in this naming. But sensitivity reactions, adverse reactions to foods, to chemicals, inhalants that are not allergy are far more common than allergy is. And so people try the naturopath's diet feel well for the first time and then regard the doctor as a complete idiot. Doctor was technically right, but he was mm. wrong in guiding that. But person. is that, are we talking semantics here? Because, um, you know, you mentioned four types of allergic or sensitivity responses. Immune sensitivity. Immune sensitivity responses. And, yeah. and the type one, which is what most people associate with. That's hay it, fever as Yeah, well, is so. that IgE thing, which is really yeah. easy to identify because it happens within seconds. contact, 10 seconds, maybe minutes. Yeah. But the other ones could take hours or even a day or two to Days. kick in. They do. Then they do. And yep. not all of them, this is the thing that people don't appreciate, not all are immunological. We, we have now the common argument of my immune system's low. No one knows their immune system's low. There can be lots of inflammation and it's an overactive immune system. But people think they're catching everything when really they're at war with everything. Hmm. We measure the immune system and it's far more commonly hyperactive than it is underactive. So people's feeling is, if I'm feeling terrible, my immune system must be poor. It can be triggered the other way. Lots of the chemicals that we're exposed to trigger aggressive immune responses. People feel terrible and then think I must have caught something every time. Worse, every doctor thinks the same way, gives an antibiotic, and then you transfer what is simply a reaction to, say, a food to a dysbiosis, to a perpetual long-term inflammatory outcome that doesn't mm. serve the person at all well. Yeah. Look, um, you know, this, this is such a big topic, this whole chemical sensitivity. How has it changed over the years? I mean, are we... We keep introducing more chemicals. Yeah, exactly. So in, in, the general, in the general term, when you introduce another few thousand every year, a lot of them are ostensibly to replace the bad ones of the past. But if the mindset of industry is we have to profit from the sale of chemicals. You get these things that you plug into the wall now. They're plugged in everywhere and they spit out fumes. You have mortine, for example, being pushed out all over the place in kids' rooms at night. The implication is it's a lot better than grandma spraying you, but the effect is the same. Mm. Everybody's breathing things that are not biological agents. So when the number of chemicals go up, you don't get less of a problem. You just get different people affected by that problem. And some people feel a lot better. The organochlorines took 30 years to run out of our systems. And, you know, they were banned 15, 18 years ago completely. And we still see people affected by those all these years later. Why they're called persistent. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> Cause right. Because they persist. Yeah. And, you know, irritatingly, or worse than irritatingly, they get into breast milk. And so mm. the mothers that were exposed raised children doing the best they could with breastfeeding. And for approximately 15 or 20 years there, there was a pretty good chance that breast milk was less good for you than getting artificial milk. Wow. Not because breast milk was bad, but because it was contaminated in a way that a growing baby really didn't need. Yeah. And so it yeah, well, then we get into baby. the water that they used instead to make the formula and we, oh, we get... That's anyway, true. It's going down one that's, of those trapdoors. That's trap true. Doors. You, it's going it, down one of those trapdoors. In general, breastfeeding is always better. Yeah. And I want to say that. Now, listen, you mentioned children's because I know another part of your practice is very much on, on childhood behaviour, children's behavioural problems. And I've seen some of the statistics. Can you just share with our listener, you know, what are some of these problems that we're seeing and how common are they? Depends where you want to start. Um, 
One of the problems is the measurement problem, that once you're aware of something, you see it and you didn't see it before. So autism in young kids was just considered bad behaviour at school. No one thought of it 30, 40 years ago as if it were a medical issue or a, or a fixable issue. It was just bad kids that didn't pay attention. I have a problem with this because once the drug companies head into the scene and say, hey, we can fix those bad kids and amphetamines are going to do them a lot of good for the future, that's not an answer. You mm. have not figured out what went wrong. This is, Ritalin, this is a Ritalin type. That's uh, right. Ritalin and dexamphetamine and Concerta, they all do a job that is quite remarkable, but it's the wrong question being answered. They are things that have a debt in the future. It's like putting the kids on a credit card and then finding you've got to pay it off when they get to 15, 16, they're getting addicted to other kinds of chemicals, and you've started that in the early years of life in high school. So behavioural disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, these are becoming increasingly common. There have been so many things change in our environment. So you have some people saying it's all about vaccines. Some people it's all about sugars in food. Other people it's all about uh, colours, flavours and preservatives. The problem that we've got is we're an uncontrolled experiment of life. Mm. We have had now, say, four generations, moving up to four generations, where the move from food to supermarket food-like substances has been almost complete. And Michael Pollan's long, you know, those seven words, eat food, not too much, mainly plants. By food, he meant something your great-grandparents could have eaten. Mm. You eat that and you feed your children that and you make it mainly plants, and not too much of it. You don't have obesity, you don't have behavioural disorders, you don't have microbiome disorders. You get a harmony between the environment, what you eat, the gut microbes, and the body. So I, I'm a big fan of not intervening as if this is a biochemical problem of the child. What I see is that children with, again, the methylation disorders, you can give them their B12, you can give them their methylfolate, behavior improves, no doubt about it. Mm. Their problem is that that should not have broken that early on in life. If there's a methylation issue, generally kids get through it. So what's going on that puts the pressure on that weak spot of the child is the far more interesting question. Mm. And I, I have inklings that all of those things that when you do the vaccines diet where there's no um, change from summer to winter to any other time of the year where there's no variability when we're in houses where kind of constant temperature that these these are environments actually unfit for humans we are well adapted to variety to differences to temperature changes to microbes every baby sticks everything in their mouth they're immunizing themselves a thousand times an hour and at that rate of kind of intervention that's a natural way that the body's well adapted to. When we try and stabilise everything, put people in schools, bore half of them to death, then we're not honouring the individuals and we find the weak spots and that, change, that goes as behavioural changes Do and you mentioned You mentioned autism and, and I'd seen some statistics where, um, you know, 1979 it was the figure was something like one in five or 10,000, one in 5,000 or 10,000. And in, in Australia now, I've heard statistics like one in a hundred and even in parts of America, one in 50. Yeah. Um, is that just diagnosis? I mean, no. no it's not. No. Something definitely is going on. Yeah. You and I have 35-ish to 40-ish years. That's enough time to see two mm. generations mm. and enough time to see the bloody obvious. You do not need randomised trials to figure this out. Behaviour has changed. Mm. The profession's view of it has changed from ignoring it entirely and hoping it goes away to medicating half of the people who turn up with any kind of neurobehavioural defect. So a part of this is the business model of medicine. Mm. When there's a drug, especially expensive drug, and especially if parents are desperate for their children to be able to participate and compete in school, they'll do anything and doctors similarly will do anything to make a difference. Do we think it's a good idea? Nearly every doctor, every psychiatrist thinks it's a bad idea, but we can't stop doing it. Mm. And to go the extra distance, I, I'm part of the Society of Lifestyle Medicine, to go the extra distance and say, does this happen in, in other groups where they have more natural diet with a seasonal variation? It doesn't happen there. Mm. It just doesn't happen. So yeah. we know that we're missing something. There's a move in psychiatry to say, do you know what? Food and diet are important in the way the brain functions. And it's like 
an epiphany <laughs> of psychiatry which goes back all the way to Hippocrates, which goes back way before that. To rediscover it is exciting, but it's way overdue. Yeah. Yeah. And so even on the most behaviorally disturbed kids, for understanding the genetics, understanding that, that you know some of them are gluten reactive, putting them onto diets that are not too threatening. I have a big problem with the salicylate diet simply because with you cut out fruit and vegetables, mm. you cut out the seasonality. And so you put people on highly restricted diets that can do a bit of good, but you've got to get them food again. So I go back to diet, nutrition, and the most important thing these days for kids is no screens in their bedroom at night. Huge challenge. Huge it, challenge. It's impossible. They they sneak it in. Mm. It seems like an addiction, the type of which yeah. we've never seen before. So we get, we say, well, at least I'd have the blue screen, you know, put the night yeah. shift on so it's yeah. more orange. And that's like the chair on the Titanic has moved to the back. Yes. <laughs> well, we, we've done programs on, on the electromagnetic radiation effect of it, but there's a whole social aspect of it, which which talk about neurotransmitters. I mean, uh, addictions are like uh, you wouldn't give a kid alcohol or a heroin or cigarettes because you know that's very addictive. Mm. Um, but here they get handed devices which get the same dopamine pumping yeah. and they become addicted. But we digress for a moment. We do. Um, what, that's you, the fun. The fun with you is the digression. The digression. I've got to say. Um, but uh, you mentioned also breast milk and parents' toxicity and how that can affect. But... Parent toxicity and children's behavioural issues are also linked. Sure. How? Sure. Um, the parents' expectations are for perfect children these days. That's one way in which it's linked. <laughs> That's one of the toxicities. And yes, That's uh, a toxic thought. It's it actually is. It's it toxic. Is. Thoughts can be extremely toxic. Yeah. Emotions can be extremely toxic. But once the expectation is that every child will achieve at school, they will you know, go on to be high achievers, once there's no honouring for the variability of one child from another you do see a toxic tendency that we want everyone to be better. This CRISPR technology, have you heard of CRISPR? No. The manipulation of the uh, genetics of an ovum or the early blastocyst, so you get blue eyes, tall children. You, you actually can, at trivially low cost, customise a baby. Wow. It's done for other mammals already. And one view of medicine is the bright future is we'll design people who are perfect, who don't have disease, and that kind of thinking is mm. just, to me, it's the opposite of evolution and biology. Biology tries the experiments. Yes, there's tragedies, but resilience is built on variability mm. of not having a monoculture of humans. Yes. We try the monoculture, houses for safety, air conditioning. We do all kinds of things to prevent us getting sick, and we sick it in a different way. Mm. And all we're doing is shifting from... There'll be some people who are very weakened, who could get pneumonia, and we can get them saved in hospital at high cost. Do we do anything for the health of people so that they don't get pneumonia in the first place? It's an irrelevant question to my profession. Mm -hmm. But I even remember talking to the chief health officer about, you know, how do kids get these particular infections? So it's 10 times, say, meningococcal disease, 10 times more likely in a smoker's home. And the attitude of the chief health officer was disease strikes randomly. There is no pattern. You cannot predict it. Don't even mm -hmm. think that way. Random disease hits. Our job as doctors is pick up the pieces afterwards, patch it all together, get them on their way and hope it doesn't hit again. It's a very interesting philosophical question, isn't it? I mean, as a doctor, and, and, I th and I've said this before, that I think the common denominator in those that prescribe and those that are integrative and holistic is that they genuinely do want the best for their patients. Sure. But I think there's a basic philosophical question. Is your role as a doctor to manage disease, in which case it's a, you're part of a very good economic model, or is your role to find out what causes the disease? And this harks back 3,000 years, in two and a half to 3,000 years. There was a Hippocratic model. You let your food be your medicine. There was the concept of diet, the concept of environment, the concept of stress and socialization, and it never worked out financially. The Romans took it over, and it was rubor, tumor, dolor, uh, what is it? Well, hang on, I better How, get this uh, right. Yeah, there was Calor, dolor, tumor, rubor. Okay. And if it's not red, hot, and swollen, send them home, charge them but then get them to come back when it's... Smaller. When it is any of those. And so if you didn't have a lump, you didn't have a disease. Yeah. 
And the concept of the Medicare system was once you've got a lump, that's dead easy because we can cut the lump out. We could do something about it. If you take the time and you go through life, you can't charge people for that. Yeah, and there's another thing too, isn't it? I mean, people, I think, need to understand that disease isn't a light switch. Yesterday you were perfectly healthy Mm. and today you've got a diagnosable disease. By the time it reaches diagnosable disease, a lot's happened in between. In fact, the most important question that I ask, I never let them know ahead of time, but the most important question is, what happened a year or two before you got sick? Mm. And people will say, oh, nothing, I was well. But you expand that and they pick up very quickly that, oh, yeah, I went to Indonesia, I got terribly sick, I got those antibiotics, but I got better. And then I was working longer hours, I had to do my PhD, I was work, staying up nights, my sleep. but I, I wasn't that sick. And so the sum total of those debts that we have to our body, mm. if not paid off, show as a disease. They show as a, a rapid decline. Yeah. And if you ask why, you've got to go back through that long history. If you say, what did you get? You can give an antibiotic mm. for it. Mm-hmm. And there's a big difference in those models. Yeah. Now, listen... Um, <laughs> Here's another topic that I I know a lot of doctors feel uncomfortable about, vaccinations. Why is it such a contentious issue? Yeah, if I as a doctor say anything uh, contrary to vaccination, I put my registration at risk. So let's just say it is controversial. Yeah, that's why I ask why. The reason it's become controversial, I think, is that it's a public health issue and public health has to protect the weakest, the most, um, the people who can't access medical care. And there's not a doubt in the world that vaccination did the job that it was meant to do. It reduced disease states of the things we could vaccinate for. It saved many, many lives, millions of lives around the world. Yeah. When something is that good, and when the profession remembers greatly, you know, paralysis of polio, mm. it's an emotional argument. Right at the moment, it should not even be a big argument. We've won the war against many of these diseases. Mm. The fear is if we don't vaccinate, could they come back? We're better at managing diseases 30, 40 years on. Now we have vaccine-preventable diseases that are down to such low levels because of vaccination that the risk is being lowered. Yep. But we as a profession are unwilling to let go of our old fears now, Mark, you and I both have daughters of similar ages uh, mm. in their early 30s, late 20s, early yes. 30s, and you've even got a, a teenager. When my oldest daughter, 31, when 28-year-olds were born, I think from memory they were vaccinated about with 11 different vaccines in the first mm. 18 months of life, but today there are many more. I mean, how many more? Many, many more. (laughs) However, they're wrapped up in less needles. In less needles. And so the thought was people aren't turning up because no one likes to see their baby crying. And if we put more into less needles, that may get around some of the resistance to vaccination. Mm. I don't think that's a terrible idea. I don't think it's a great idea. If there is a reaction to vaccines, it's often going to be to the adjuvant, the stuff that's in there with the aluminium and the formaldehyde. People think that vaccines are accidentally contaminated. That's not accidental. You've got to put those agents in because you're delivering something that normally would go through the mouth or throat or gut. You're putting it in the skin. If you just jab the microbes, nothing happens. The body doesn't fight it. So you put the aluminium formaldehyde, it creates an irritation. The immune cells are brought onto that site. And therein lies one of the problems, that there are some kids very close to the edge at the time they're vaccinated. They are the ones that suffer the majority of the problems because Mm. without anyone knowing it, they were just too close to a particular edge. And so allergies and inflammation can get out of control. On the whole, it is good for the community. And it's very useful that vaccinations have done the job that they are uh, meant to have done. It does not mean that we have to become almost um, vaccine Nazis. In a, in a funny sense now, we're taking money away from people. We are forcing them to not go to preschools. When we've already won the childhood vaccination, we've got the 93 mm. to 94%. Even in the Medical Journal of Australia, it said that's not even the battle anymore. If you're going to vaccinate, it's adults 
the 60% of adults that carry these diseases are entirely unvaccinated. You don't get 1% differences in the children making a difference, but if you're going to go down the vaccine pathway, vaccinate the adults and the teenagers, the ones that carry the disease now. Hmm. However, it's hard to isolate those people. You can't say to the whole population, if you don't line up, we're not giving you your tax return because you get voted out. But it is easier to do it when Hmm. you say terrible parents are not vaccinating their children. I see these stories a lot where children and their siblings have had terrible reactions to vaccines. The mother's instinct is, I want to delay it. I want to put this off. But if they don't fit in, they can't pay their rent. They can't Hmm. buy their food and they certainly can't get childcare. And that creates a real dilemma. This is because the government, it is a federal government thing, or is it a state government thing where where we're holding back the child benefit for childcare if you don't show that you are vaccinated? That's right. So there's two. Federal is what happens with the taxation and the family tax benefits and the rebates. So they control the money side. If you haven't had your vaccines, you don't get the family tax benefit. It means a couple of thousand dollars per child. Mm. And families who are struggling don't really have a choice about that. You know, if you five, ten thousand one way or another, it's the difference between being comfortable and not. At the state level, they control education. So the federal government has pushed this idea of no jab, no play. Mm. And so that means now that kids that have not been vaccinated can't go to childcare and can't enrol in childcare. And I think nearly everybody in public health thinks that's a terrible idea because what does it do? The unvaccinated kids will now aggregate elsewhere. The whole idea of herd immunity is it only works if you've got even distribution. Mm. And if you suddenly pull one group out and put them somewhere else, you've got the very thing that you least want, which is the capacity to breed up with those diseases all over again Mm. because there's no herd immunity in that herd. So for parents who were contemplating or at that stage, I guess resilience is, you know, know the child is as healthy as can be. That's the advice that I give to parents is choose your time for the vaccination. Don't fall into this thing of, oh, Christ, I've caught, you know, I have to catch up here. What the hell? Mm. And the kids are sick and you go and get them vaccinated just to make sure that the family tax benefit covers through. Think ahead. Decide when their child's resilient. Mothers look their babies in the eyes and know when they're well and know when they're not. Men, the fathers often don't. You know, kids mm. are kids are kid. Mm. Um, but choosing your time, the vaccination at the appropriate time, the building of immunity and the ability to look at your own child and say, what's your needs, not what is the average need of the population. And that's that's simple, straightforward advice. It minimises the terrible outcomes that can happen with both vaccination and disease, both of them. Yeah. Yeah. There's no free lunches ever in medicine. Things that work as well as vaccination occasionally foul up. We have doctors in the vaccine in our community saying we should have a compensation scheme. But a compensation scheme is costly. You then have to say, well, there are bad reactions. And the government here has resisted it. The US has not, and each has their own way of going about it. But there are injuries. Mm. When you see the injuries, we should, as a community, say, well, you've done stuff for the good of the community. We will, you know, we'll contribute to you. We'll look after your kid with any damage that occurs. What What is some of the complications of vaccinations? Well, the, the one that is the absolute contraindication is anaphylaxis. You occasionally get anaphylaxis and death. Yeah. And so, that's so this is that, the extreme allergic that's right. response. That's the extreme, but it's also the only reason that a child can be exempted from vaccination is to have had one of those responses and not wanting to have it again. The other more common things are they get asthma, they get the eczema, they get acute effects that happen within 48 hours of the vaccine. Some of the time it settles down, some of the time it doesn't settle down. There's about 300 to 400 hospitalisations each year post-vaccination. Some of them have terrible outcomes, but very rare. So we, you would say that the adverse reactions to vaccines are maybe one in 10,000, one in 5,000 that are really significant. But they do happen. And the Mm. point is, if we deny that and just keep on saying, no, vaccines are perfect, there are no problems, Mm. then we're denying what we should do in medicine, which is just be aware that when you do good, there's always a cost. And the small cost of vaccination should be a small cost for us to be Mm. aware of. Listen, we've covered so many uh, areas there. It's been fantastic. I wanted to finish by asking you this question. and, And what do you think the biggest challenge people face in our modern world in their health journey through their lives. What do you think that is? Yeah, you ask the easy questions at the very end there <laughs> after I've exhausted my brain. Uh, well, what? it's just whatever comes to your mind. First, yeah. uh, you know. 
I think that we're in a period where we're taking back ownership of our health. And there's a difficult transition there. There's been centuries of doctors being the owners of the information that people require to make themselves healthy. And as doctors, we're a little uncomfortable with amateurs looking after their own health. I say this with all respect to my profession, medicine is anti-evolutionary. We do believe that evolution is the best description of biology. Medicine is the survival of the richest, the survival of those with access to medical services, and we're unwilling to allow nature to intervene in that process. But natural resilience, babies putting things in their mouth, crawling in the dirt, petting animals, um, eating foods in season half choking babies do terrible things but it's part of developing resilience we've made every playground a rubberized surface the rubber is more toxic than the grass used to be under it people fall and they may bounce a bit but kids chew that stuff we've become so used to a protected and controlled world that mums are coming back to say Mums and dads, actually the dads are good when it comes to take the risk every so often, but mums and dads are coming back and saying, is all this really necessary? Do we need to medicalise ourselves? And if there's one good thing with the internet, there's a discussion which is the kind of user groups, the people who've been through something, and that harks back right through history, that when the doctors own the knowledge and they become irrelevant to their patient base, people emerge, learn, and do things themselves. And I think this is a painful emergence, but it is wonderful to see mothers gain the confidence again to raise healthy children, to come and talk about the diet, to come and talk about sleep, to come and talk about these little machines that we take in. To me, that's a mark that we can get through this. When I see doctors prescribe as the only way through, I lose all hope that we've got any chance for resilience in the future. So to me, the major challenge is we support the population in understanding how to manage their health. We are servants of the people again. And if we can get to that stage, we'll not have this fight where it's us against the idiots, then we're going to have healthy, resilient children growing to healthy, resilient adults, having healthy and resilient babies, and we'll be able to leave them alone to do that rather than intervene every step. Fantastic. What a note to finish on. Thank you so much, Mark. I really enjoyed this conversation. My pleasure. It's so interesting talking with Mark. So many great insights and a very holistic approach. I mean, he's been dealing with these issues for many years and his focus has been on identifying a patient's chemical sensitivity while acknowledging that a physiological limit has been exceeded. He uses the analogy of our health having anchors as one after another of those anchors is cast off, our health suffers, and how that manifests itself may depend on your genetic predisposition. Now, when it comes to environmental stresses, be it electromagnetic radiation or chemicals we're exposed to in our food, water, personal care products, even furnishings or clothes, well, it's a big topic. But an important point is that government policy lags many years behind, as, for that matter, do regulatory bodies or professional health organisations. For me, there are quite a few takeaways from this discussion. For a start, chronic disease is multifactorial, and the five stresses, or perhaps we could call them five anchors, emotional, environmental, nutritional, postural and dental, are a good way of thinking about what causes chronic degenerative diseases. But that rarely lends itself to quick fixes. Another lesson was when it comes to environmental stresses, that means chemical exposure, the precautionary principle is a very good preventive guiding principle. That means if something has the potential to cause harm, it's best avoided or at least minimised. And the last thing was the five pillars. Look, sleep, breathe, nutrition, move and thought are a great way of building resilience and again... The fix may take time, but hey, play the long game. It's called life. So make sure you look at the transcripts on my website that accompany each and every podcast. We will have links to Mark's webpage as well. Now visit the Facebook page, read some of the blogs, give some feedback, and until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well.
This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak...